going to get ready to get into God's presence, amen? Well, you know, if you and I are here, it means we're already in God's presence, amen? Because God's word says where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there with us, amen? And I'm just glad that God's presence is already here, and we're going to worship God. So stand with us this morning. I just want you to raise your hands, mm. and I want you to pray this with me this morning. Are you ready? Say, Heavenly Father, I love you. And I just ask that you would let me love on you this morning. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Mm. Your feet. 
worship you this morning. God, we worship you this morning. Thank you, Lord. God, thank you, Lord. God, you are so good. We worship you, Lord. Ooh.
This morning we're singing about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and that he's a way maker. I want you to grab your cup this morning, your communion cups. You know, the Word of God says that Jesus said that we're supposed to partake of this cup. That is a reminder of what he has done. Amen. It's a reminder that he chose to step out of heaven onto this earth and pay the price for all mankind. Amen. You know, Revelations, it talks about that he will make a way in the desert where there seems to be no way. He will make a way in the desert. He will put a river in the desert. You may be going through something right now. But it's only something. Because God has already made a way. He said, this is my covenant that I make with you today. That I would allow my body to be broken. That I would allow my blood to be spilled. So that you who do this in remembrance of me will have a way. His body is good. His blood is awesome. And I just want you to just take this in remembrance of what he's done, of the covenant that he has made with you and I. Because that's what the word of God says. That he made a covenant. God made a covenant with mankind that we would have everything that he says in his word. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It only matters what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says that you're healed, that you've been set free, amen, by His blood, by His blood, by His body, a covenant that He made. So this morning, take the blood, take the body, and do it, and thank Jesus for what He's done. Amen. Wait. 
give our all to you this morning. God, we give our all to you this morning. We give our all to you this morning. And God, we ask that your freedom would reign in this place. Mm. If you if you have ever been in a place, if you've ever been in a place where you have have been have struggled with something and God has walked you through that and you've received freedom in that area in your life, I want you to raise your hand this morning. If you have something that God has set you free from, I want you to raise your hand this morning. Amen? Amen. See, that's, that's just it, is we can worship God because in his presence, there's freedom. Amen? So, how many, uh, raise your hands again. Raise your hands again. Now, if there's something in your life that you're struggling with right now, if there's something you're struggling with, see the hands that are up right now? These are all people that God has set them free. And if God likes them enough to set them free, he'll do the same for you. Amen? Amen? Because God says that he loves all of his children. Amen? So if you need freedom in your life, tonight, today's the day to do it. Today's the day to just give it to God and to just trust him. Amen? Amen. Mm, I want you to turn to somebody and I want you to say, I'm free in Jesus' name. Hmm. Amen. Thank God for his freedom, amen? Well, hey, we get to enter into just another aspect of worship, and that is tithe and offering, amen? So, <clears throat> Josh was talking about being set free. I want to share something this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, with you about being set free. You see, I used to think in a poverty-minded mentality. You see, I used to think that there was nothing I could do to be better in this world until I got born again. Amen? And when I got born again, you see, I got, I got, I'm going to share something with you. I used to be a person that used to be on welfare. Amen? I used to get the cheese. My family used to get the cheese and stuff. And I didn't think that I would ever be able to get out of that until I got born again. And I began to read in God's word. He said that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You see, then it also says in Luke 6, it says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I put God's word to work in my life. There was a point in our life, in me and my wife's lives, that as, new, as I was a new believer, she was already a believer, but I began to apply the principles of what God says in his word about seed time and harvest. And what I started to do is one time me and my wife decided that we were going to take and start tithing off what we wanted to make the previous, the next year. And this is from somebody that didn't want to give anything to God. But I stepped out in faith. And we started tithing on what we wanted to make the following year. We began to, to take I don't even remember the amount, but we began to take and apply that into our lives. And if that's God, tell him I'm doing the best job I can. <laughs> Praise God. So we started applying that principle in our lives. Because I kept on reading in his word that God is a giver. Because he first said that I gave my only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall have life and life abundantly. Amen. So if that's true, and if God is true, then if I put his word to work in my life, then it's got to come to pass. And so we did it. You know, in Malachi, God says, just test me in it. Just see what I'll do. So we started, began to, to tithe. We, we began to tithe a little bit more, a little bit more. A little bit more. And we began to see God move in our lives. And before we knew it, by the end of the year, what we were tithing is what we were making. 
Amen. You see, God, please, this, I'm not saying up here be a prosperity teacher or a preacher. What I'm here to tell you is that God's word works. And if you work it in your life, it'll work in your life. But you got to do it. Amen. All right. So there's three ways to give. You can text to give. Boy, they always jump that screen off on me. 810-202-0605. That's one way to give. See, th this lettering up here is bigger than that lettering back there. I'm believing for a bigger screen in Jesus' name. I'm believing for a bigger screen in Jesus' name. Um, okay, the second way you can do it is uh, you can mail it in, and on the back side of those chairs, you can also give today. And the ushers are going to be walking around, and they're going to have baskets like this, and you can put it in. So let me pray over you as you give. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you, for your people, Lord Jesus, Lord, that as they follow your word, Lord Jesus, that your word will come to pass in their life, Lord Jesus. Lord, you said that they are uh, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming in and blessed going out. So we stand upon your word today, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Will. I think we should pray for his eyes rather than pray for a new screen. Where'd he go? You want us to pray for your eyes? All right. Okay, you guys reach toward. I'm serious. Anybody else that's uh, really uh, been struggling with your eyesight lately, if it's been fading, put your hand on your own eyes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for healing virtue to flow into our eyes. I pray, Lord, that you will increase the strength of the muscles around them. And I pray, Lord, that you will increase the efficiency of our eyes so that they will send the right signal. And I pray that our brain will process it correctly. And I thank you, Lord, for people who can see. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> You never know when you have an opportunity to pray for something or somebody, right? And uh, every now and then you get some really interesting opportunities to, uh, to pray for people. And um, I've had some really weird ones happen through the years. And, um, you know, it's, I mean, just, just odd dynamics where you got an opportunity to pray for somebody in a, in a strange or unusual Situation. I had a number of years ago where um, I was out uh, umping a, ba a softball game, and I was umping the softball game, and it went into uh, extra innings. And um, and at that time, the umpires didn't really have to stay past a certain time, and they said, "Will you stay?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll stay." And so we stayed, and even though it's past time limit, anyway, that inning, um, a, a line shot was hit through the the infield toward the pitcher. And uh, the pitcher uh, happened to be mostly drunk. And uh, instead of reaching out his glove toward it, he reached out his bare hand toward the ball. When he reached out his bare hand toward the ball, you could not only hear the skin as the ball hit it, you could hear the bro bones break. And everybody heard it. I mean, it was just a boom, terrible sound. And, um, and the guy looked at his hand like it was some kind of a thing that wasn't really attached to his body. He looked at it, he kind of shook it, and he says, I think I'll be okay. And so he finished the inning, and uh, maybe it was good at that point in time he had that amount of alcohol in him because he couldn't feel as much pain as he might would have without it. And uh, so he finished the inning after the game was over. Um, I went up to him and I said, uh, can I pray for your hand? And, um, and he looked at me and he said, um, yeah. So I put my hand on top of his hand and on bottom of his hand and I said, Lord, I just pray that you will restore these bones and knit them together and make them whole in Jesus' name. And so, um, and then, then uh, he took his hand out and he looked at it again like it was some kind of an unusual object attached to his arm. And he shook it around and he went like this and he looked at me and he says, are you Jesus? I said, no, I'm not Jesus, but I know him pretty good. And uh, the thing about it is, is you never know where you're going to get a chance to pray. And uh, never miss the opportunity to uh, pray for somebody. Because, you know, somebody said, well, 
Um, what if I pray and, and nothing happens? Well, here's what I can guarantee you. If you don't pray, nothing is going to happen. And if you do pray, something may happen. And especially if you pray in faith. So, you know, just that you never know. So go ahead and pray. You have nothing to lose by praying and everything to gain. I've had a lot of people that um, I've offered prayer to through the years. I've had probably, I don't know, I count on one hand the number of people who've turned down prayer when they were in pain. I can tell you this much. When people are in pain, they want prayer. Okay, prayer, prayer and pain go together, and they want prayer. And, and I've, I've only had a few people that have said no, but uh, most people have said yes when they were in uh, pain. And so, um, you know, if you see somebody in pain, offer prayer and, uh, and see what God does. It's an amazing thing. Amen? How many of you had a great uh, Happy New Year? Yeah? Was it fun? Did you have a good time? And uh, I know that uh, New Year's is, is, a, is a great, great season. It's the season of unlimited football games. Um, I mean, it seems like they go from game to game to game to game. I had no idea until recently. I mean, there are so many bowl games available now that, I mean, it used to be, it used to be a small number. There are so many bowl games now that it's, it's kind of like they'll even take a team with a losing record and put them in a bowl game because it's like there's not enough winning teams to play in all these games. And, and all of these teams that have, uh, you know, connected to them, there's uh, all kinds of, um, like, sponsors. And uh, so you'll have different sponsors for different games. And, and, and during the course of that football game, you'll get to uh, watch a whole lot of commercials about that company that sponsored them. And uh, it's all an interesting thing. But if you like to watch something other than football, chances are you're a little, you've turned your television off and you may not turn it back on again for a few days because uh, you got tired of watching all the football games and, and tired of that stuff. Well, I enjoyed, I enjoyed um, this season of, of um, you know, just moving into this new year from 2021. And the truth is, is uh, I saw something the other day I thought was kind of cute uh, on Facebook, and, and it says uh, something about welcome to 2022. It seems like only yesterday it was 2021. Well, you know, that was on, that was on New Year's Day, and it's true, only yesterday it was 2021. And, uh, but yesterday, I had the opportunity to be with my friend and partner in ministry for many, many years, Pastor Joe Schichtel, and he went to heaven on the very first day of 2022. And at 5.45 p.m. yesterday, he went to be with the Lord. And uh, as he was going to be with the Lord, I had an opportunity to sing, It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face all sorrow will erase. So help me run the race till we see Christ. And he went to see the Lord while we were singing that song. And I'm so thankful for a friend who's been so faithful. Um, Pastor Joe was the kindest man that I ever met, bar none. Probably the only one that I knew of that was even close to that was my own father. And the only reason my father wouldn't rank higher is because my own father spanked me. <laughs> so I actually saw that side of him and, and, uh, and, 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 and it, it put the fear of God into me. Or at least the fear of a belt, I don't know. But, but uh, you know, Pastor Joe was the kindest man that I ever met. And, and it was good to be with him when he went to be with Jesus. We're going to miss him. Here on this earth, there's going to be a great celebration of his uh, life. I don't know the date yet, but we're going to be celebrating his life together as a congregation. He was here when I came here. He was one of those uh, rare folks of you that were here when I came to Revival Center almost 31 years ago. And uh, he served at that time as a deacon. Later on, he, uh, he served as pastor of a church that we planted out in the Buckley area. And then he came back here and served as an elder here at Revival Center. And um, one day I couldn't, couldn't imagine how Pastor Joe could do so many things and not get tired. Because he never seemed to get tired. He just like kept going and going and going. He was like the Energizer Bunny. And I thought, how does he do all that stuff without getting tired? So I followed him around one day. And here's what I found. He never did anything for more than two hours. 
And then he'd go to another thing and he'd do that. And he'd go to another thing and he'd do that. And he'd go to another thing and do that. So he never got tired or bored because he kept going to something different to do. And then maybe later in the day he'd come back to the thing that he started on and get it done. So I, I thought to myself, you know, there's some wisdom in that. You know, uh, don't, don't work on it till you're exhausted. Just go ahead and do something else that you want to do and then come back to it. And uh, that's how he lived life and he did a great, great job with it. And now he is with, um, he is with his uh, lovely life, wife, uh, Jan, and uh, with, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for him. This day is a special day um, because uh, Pastor Joe was... Um, he had a great heart, you know, for Revival Center, and um, he was the one that um, he was the one that discovered the land that this building is set on. He was the one that discovered it, and um, I'll tell that story at some point in time, in a little more depth. But it was he that found this place, and uh, he that had a heart for coming here first. And I'm so thankful that he did, and uh, so grateful for him. Now, today is a, a special day in this regard as well. Today is the beginning of our 40-day forgiving challenge. Now, I wondered if Pastor Joe ever had to forgive anybody because Pastor Joe didn't ever seem to hold a grudge. But I can tell you this much along the way. He did forgive a few folks, and he told me some of his stories of forgiveness. But I'm excited to begin a 40-day journey with you called the Forgiving Challenge. And I, I want to encourage you um, in these next uh, six Sundays to be here um, every Sunday. If something happens and you absolutely can't be here, then make sure you check it out online so that you get the sermon. Because here's what this consists of. It consists of six sermons that I believe are going on six different subjects that are all connected to forgiving and, uh, and, and all very, very important for us to hear about because they work together for good in our lives. And, and we're going to be doing that for 40 days, six Sundays, along with the days in between where uh, we'll be uh, encouraging you. There are 40 days of challenges in, in here. Now, this may look like a thick book. But here's what I can tell you. You only read about two or three pages at a time, and then there's a challenge. The challenge is the tough part, not the reading. And um, if you don't like to read, I can tell you that uh, my wife, Pat Markham, she will be having, she will be reading this uh, on Facebook so that there will be a posting every single day. And if you're not a person who likes to read or you would like to add um, her reading to your reading, then uh, it will be on Facebook, and you'll be able to to uh, take that and, and use that and do that challenge. We have challenges for the children, and books are being passed out in the kids' church area so that families can do this together. You say, why is forgiving so important? I believe with all of my heart that giving, uh, forgiving is so important because of the fact that it is unforgiveness is the single thing that stops us from fulfilling our destiny in Christ. See, some people, they're looking for all kinds of things to say, well, why, why am I struggling in this area? I can tell you this much. If you get right down to the bottom line, it's dealing with this area of forgiveness. And sometimes we have not dealt with it very well. But what if in 40 days we can walk out of this 40 days with freedom for our future? What if we can walk into our destiny knowing that God has his hand on us and knowing that we are indeed free. You see, it's a 40-day experience. It's not, a, it's not a let me show up on week one or let me just kind of dip my toes into it a little bit. No, no, no. I, I'm asking you to go for this. I'm asking you to do this, uh, to, 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 to enter into this 40 days with everything that's in your heart. And I want to invite those of you who have been in church all of your life or those who are here for the first time, I want to invite you into this 40 days of forgiveness. I invite you to invest 40 days learning about the grace and forgiveness of Jesus. The power is in the whole experience and in each part. So I don't want you to, to just do part of it. I want you to really immerse yourself in it. Each sermon each week is going to build on the last one. And so I implore you, I urge you to go through the whole process. And if you do, I promise you that you will experience the freedom of God like you may not have thought was even possible. So, look at the person next to you and say, welcome to the forgiving challenge.
It's going to be a life-changing 40-day journey to freedom. So are you ready? Are you ready? Today we're going to kind of set the table. Next week we'll have an appetizer. And, 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 and then, then I'll tell you something. I can't wait for the entree and the dessert. And this is going to be all good because Jesus does a great job cooking. And in fact, during the course of this series, you'll actually hear in time when Jesus cooked food for his disciples. I'm convinced that the Bible has something very, very true for us to know, and that is this. Jesus says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. How many of you believe that? He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And yet, it feels like sometimes those who the Son has set free, like many of us in this room, don't always feel free. How many of you could honestly say, I don't always feel free. I'm not experiencing that freedom. Even some of us may still feel bound up in chains. And let me tell you, others see it as well. We claim to be, we talk about being followers of Christ and walking in the freedom that Jesus has for us. But sometimes it's not like that, or at least it's not observed like that by others. There's a reason why Christians have become to be known as too political, too judgmental, too homophobic, too old-fashioned, and too boring by those outside of us. You said, well, maybe, maybe it's because the, the, the media has painted us incorrectly. Well, 50% of millennials who were asked about that, 50% of them said, no, 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 I came to that understanding based on an experience with a person who said that they were a follower of Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a follower of Christ that isn't like him. I want to be like Jesus. Now, I realize that there are many failures along the way and that I've experienced a number of them, but I really want to be like Jesus. I, 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 want to, I, I, want, I don't want it to have gone wrong. Jesus isn't lying when he says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He sets captives free, and that's what he does. So, so you think to yourself, well, why is it then that many of us aren't living or experiencing the free, full, abundant life that God offers to us? Well, we're going to find out, and we are going to pursue what Jesus promised us. How many of you know that anything of value in the kingdom of God has to be pursued? We need to go after it. Anything in life that is of any value is something that you go after until you can obtain it. You don't just say, well, you know, well, if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. No. We are a people who say, you know what? God has something for me, and I'm not going to quit until I obtain what God has for me. Jesus paid for it, and I want to experience it in my life. We have one clapper, one amen, and, a, and, and, and you need to get with it because that's pretty good preaching. <laughs> so let's start our journey together. We're going to start on the heels of the resurrection. We're going to start there. We're going to start right after the resurrection. It's in John chapter 20 that we're going to spend a little bit of time today. The disciples are quarantined in a room. Sound familiar? They're there out of fear, and all of a sudden, Jesus walks through the wall. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it would get my attention if somebody walked through the wall without destroying the wall. They didn't have a bulldozer. He just walked through the wall. And I believe that as Jesus burst into that room, there are going to be times during this 40 days that you're going to find in your private time with him that he is going to burst into the room where you are at. God is just going to come, and you may be hiding out. You didn't invite him. You weren't expecting him, but he's going to show up because he knows what you need, and he knows when you need it, and he delivers every time. So we're going to look in John chapter 20 and beginning in verse 19. Jesus makes his presence known to the disciples. And what a moment that was. 
He rose from the dead, and the proof that he was actually risen from the dead is showed or is evidence to them when they see him come through the walls and do something that is remarkable. You say, well, what did he do when he walked through the walls? He showed them the scars in his hand and the scar on his side. He showed them that, but one of the disciples wasn't there. His name was Thomas. Most give Thomas a bad rap. His nickname is what? Doubting Thomas. But truthfully, all of the disciples were in that room cowering in fear. I think you can make the case that they were all doubting as well. Doubting Peter and doubting Matthew and doubting, these were doubting people. John was doubting. They were all doubting doubting at that moment. So while Thomas is known as the doubter, maybe he wasn't in the room because he was out actually running an errand. I don't know, but we're going to pick it up in verse 24, and here's what it says about Thomas. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And that's where the nickname comes from, that verse right there. But here, as we continue, it says, A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I love that. Peace be with you. And then he looks at Thomas, and he says to Thomas, Put your finger here. Thomas, put your finger here. Reach out your hand and put your finger here and put it into my side and stop doubting and believe. That's what he says to Thomas. And Thomas says to him, his response is incredible. His response is unique because no one had ever said on this earth what Thomas said that day. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And you may say, well, what's so amazing about that? Well, it's an amazing thing that a man who had been dead has burst into a locked room. But the more I sit in this story, I simply find it interesting that the resurrected, glorified body of Jesus still carries the nail scars on his hands and the the spear scarred side. Scars were on his resurrected body. And as Thomas said, my Lord and my God, I have to tell you this much. He is the first person to ever call Jesus God. The disciples, none of them, the none of the famous ones that ever called Jesus God. And yet he right then and there makes that declaration. But wouldn't you think about when you think about your How many of you have ever thought about what your body's going to be like in heaven? I have. I can tell you this much. There will be no love handles. That's right. I'm looking for a six-pack. I know. Some of you are thinking I went from a six-pack to a keg. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Some of you are thinking, man, I... I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that super primo body. I'm I'm looking looking for for a body that looks like I've been on Nutrisystem and I've been I've been doing my total gym for for a long. I'm looking for that kind of body and abs popping out and and, and but but Jesus had scars. Nobody would ever just think scars. Why would God allow the scars of Jesus to remain? Now, some people, maybe they come from this kind of a background, they say, well, it's so that we will forever remember our sin. Maybe it's to cause us to to remind us of our guilt and shame. But the truth of the matter is, is that is actually out of character of God. God isn't like that. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So that's not why he has 
scars. God doesn't want us to dwell on our shortcomings. So why does the resurrected body of Jesus have scars? What is God trying to tell us through the scars of Jesus? Now, you probably can't tell, but I have a small scar in my eyebrow. I also have a dent in my head that other people have noticed. No, my wife didn't hit me. I actually got that when I was born. They used forceps to pull me out into this world. And apparently my head was not as hard then as it is today. I think it's solid all the way through today. Those are pretty small scars, really. Those are all the scars I ever had. Up until June 23rd of 2021. And that was when they cut my chest open and they used a saw to cut my breastbone open. And rib spreaders to open me wide so they could work on me. And now I have a six or seven inch scar that goes from here down to here. And three little ones where they, I say little ones. But they're bigger than all the other scars I'd ever had where they put half-inch tubes inside of me, three of them, to drain the red stuff out, whatever that is. I have a scar on my leg that's about an inch and a half long. It's also bigger than any of the other scars I'd ever had in my life. See, some scars are really significant and other scars are not. Some scars we remember and some that we don't. The one in my eyebrow, I don't remember. I was too small, but I was told the story that I was running home and I tripped and fell and hit my head on the corner of the porch. But I don't remember that. To me, this scar represents the moment that God gave me a second chance at life. I could have and by all regards should have died because the part of your heart that's called the widow maker part was 100% blocked. But my body had grown new veins that you're not born with that were feeding that part of my heart. Literally the hand of God on me. This scar reminds me and every morning I get up and I see that scar. When it first happened after I was healing, each morning I would look and I would see the wound because it wasn't whole. I would see the wound. Day by day, I would look in that mirror and every day it was better than it had been the day before until finally it went from being a wound to being a scar. Have you ever thought about the fact that God didn't need to create us in such a way that we even have scars? He could have made us so that we could heal without scarring. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So if we have scars, it's because God's wanting us to learn something from the process. Scars tell powerful stories. Scars were actually made by God. They were his idea. He made human skin to heal, and he could have done it without scars, but he didn't. And even though some scars have little meaning to us, others have a lot to say. But the scars of Jesus have the most to say. Those scars are significant. They speak about a price paid for our freedom. When Jesus burst into that quarantine crowd of disciples, the evidence that proved to the disciples that this really was Jesus and not a ghost is when he showed them and allowed his disciples to see and touch his nail-scarred hands. That was when everything changed for Thomas. Once he put his hands in Jesus' nail-scarred hands, everything changed changed. You see, for as much grief as we give Thomas about his doubting, 
he would go on to be an incredible influence for the cause of Christ. It was Thomas that left there after Jesus ascended into glory. It was Thomas that left there and went into what is now Iraq and started the churches in Iraq, some of the oldest churches on the face of the earth. It was Thomas that then went from Iraq to India and first brought the gospel to India. And it was Thomas who then gave his life as a martyr. This man no longer could be called a doubter. Because of the scars of Jesus. The scars of Jesus have the ability to mark us and truly change us forever. The scars of Jesus tell the story of an innocent man that died a brutal death for guilty sinners. But this innocent man was also fully God. And through his death and resurrection, those same guilty sinners receive a free gift of grace that allows them to eternally, now and forever, be in right relationship with God Almighty. Not only does this grace usher us into heaven after we die, as it did with Pastor Joe, but it brings us into right relationship with him right now, today, even in this place. I'm convinced that the freedom that God has won for you is not just a long time from now when the heavens are set up and everything is right, but no, it's, it's right now, it's today. It's for you here now. It's one thing to know about the scars of Jesus. It's another to see and experience his scars. To receive from his scars what he truly wants to give to you. And that's his grace. His grace forever marks you as his. And if that is true, then his grace would also extend to us from others into the world. You see, there's a problem when we have received grace but don't understand grace and think it's because we've done something that's so extraordinary that we deserve it. And so we are not nearly as gracious to others around us. It's a problem. To receive from his scars what he truly wants to give to you, that's grace. A gift that you cannot earn or ever deserve, but it's available to you. But if that's true, then why is it that we are not more gracious? How can I receive something and not be willing to give it? Now, the Bible says very clearly, freely you've received, freely give. So I have an understanding that maybe some people don't realize exactly what they've been given. Maybe there are days when I don't realize what I have been given. Jesus is known for grace, but Christians are too often known for judgment. Grace and judgment, by definition, are polar opposites of one another. Grace is getting something free that I don't deserve. It's being on the naughty list and still getting a present. That's what grace is. Judgment is getting exactly what you deserve. A number of years ago, we were driving down the road, and we saw this beautiful wrapped present sitting by the side of the road, and it was off just a little bit, and uh, my wife says, you need to stop the car and go see what's in that box. I said, well, I don't think I want to, but I did anyway, because she asked me to, I mean, she told me to. I mean, <laughs> so I stopped the car, and I got out, and I, I, I went across the ditch and across into the, the, where it was, and, 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 and I opened the box, and I looked inside, and I thought right then, you know what, I'm going to bring it back. I'm just, I'm not going to leave it here. I'm going to bring it back, because she really deserves it. So I brought it back and opened the top, and I said, here's what's in the box, and it was dog poop. Judgment is getting what you deserve. Grace is a free gift you don't deserve. I've often struggled with this reality and find it hard to believe that a people associated with Jesus could be so far away from the life and example of Jesus. Listen to me this morning. Something has to change. 
Because if people can experience grace through us, they can begin to be changed in their life. Grace always changes you. So let me ask you this question. Think about it for a bit. It's going to be audience participation time, so you're going to get a chance to actually show your hand. Don't be embarrassed by doing so. But which is harder for you, to forgive someone else or to forgive yourself? I want you to think about it for a minute. Which is harder for you, to forgive so, to get for, forgive someone else or to forgive yourself? How many of you it's easier to forgive someone else? How many of you it's easier to forgive yourself? That's generally the response. 90% of people struggle far more with themselves than others. They're still angry with themselves and they make themselves pay for their mistakes over and over and over and over and over and over again. Deeper than our physical scars, many of us carry open wounds on the inside that we have not properly dealt with. Many of the deepest wounds we carry are truly only known by ourselves. People see you on the outside and they don't know that you're wounded on the inside. It's possible that these wounds are the result of others' actions against us, but some of the deepest, darkest wounds we've brought on or done to ourselves. Areas that we keep picking at and never allow to heal. The baggage you've been toting around wherever you go, it's time that you bring that to Jesus. While many of us may be carrying around unforgiveness for others, the person that you are most unforgiving of typically is you. While we have a long distance to go in becoming more gracious and forgiving of others, we're typically the least gracious and forgiving of ourselves. That leads me to this conclusion. You will not be truly forgiving of others until you have received forgiveness for yourself. In these next 40 days, we're not just going to learn how to forgive others. We're going to go deeper than that. We will be doing something more difficult, more painful, but incredibly freeing. We're going to learn how to truly receive God's forgiveness for ourselves. Sometimes the person hardest to forgive and our worst enemy is ourselves. Have you ever noticed that you say the rudest things to you? You say things to you that you wouldn't say to other people. You think the worst things about yourself. I don't know about you, but I want to be free from me. I want to see me the way God sees me. But sometimes what we do is we see ourselves in such a light, and then we think and we project it onto God, and we say, well, that's the way God looks at us. That's the way God sees us, and it's just not true. So I'm asking of you that you bring all your shame, bring all your guilt, bring the stuff you've been suppressing underneath the couch cushions. It's time to pull it all out. It's time to bring it all to Jesus. And if you do, I can promise you that you will experience freedom like you have never thought possible. I'm tired of living a life that's playing a game. I'm tired of Christians living that way, just scraping by, acting like everything's even, everything's great, even though we're still weighed down by the baggage that we can't let go of. I'm tired of just doing our best to manage or modify our behavior or sin. That's not freedom. Jesus revealed his scars. It's not easy to let others in. I wonder if we'll open up our wounds and show our scars. I I'll try to lead the way. I'll try to be as honest and vulnerable with you as I possibly can. Because I believe that our future together as a revival center is determined by our responses in the next 40 days. God has something that he wants to do to set us free. Jesus declares this in John 10.10, 10, I've come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. You see, the truth is there's a battle waging 
for your heart and your soul, but Jesus' scars are the assurance of victory in that battle. You say, why did Jesus come out with his scars? Because it showed that he truly defeated death, hell, and the grave. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus came out and was no longer wounded, but he had scars. He had paid a price. And you've walked through life, and you have had scars in your life. But in these days, we're going to see the wounds be healed. Once you've received the grace of Jesus... I believe with all my heart this grace will compel you to live in this world and to be forgiving of others, truly forgiving. This is the 20th chapter of the book of John. If you were to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find out that this is the 88th chapter of the Gospels. And it says this at the end of the 20th chapter. you got to get this. It says this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Don't you just love that? Isn't that a great way to end the Gospels? 88 chapters of the Gospels, and they're ended with this wonderful statement. These things have been written so that we could understand that we could have life in his name. I I love that. But if you actually have a Bible with you or you've actually read a little farther, you realize there's an 89th chapter. Have you ever read a book and there was an epilogue? An epilogue is kind of like a little tacked on thing at the end so that you know what happened next with the characters even though the story is basically over. There's an 89th chapter. There's another ending. It's an add-on. Like the story is over, but it's not over. It's not done. You see, on that day, in that room, the other disciples were there, and one of those disciples was named Peter. And Peter still need to experience forgiveness. So it's like 88 chapters of the gospel, but Jesus won't let it end with that. Won't let it end with, I suppose all of the miracles could have, I mean, it could take up more books. And he won't let it end with that. He, he, he takes us to one more scene, and I believe it's the most powerful chapter in the Bible on forgiveness, and it's where we're going to spend a good part of our time over the next 40 days. It's kind of like sometimes God's best work comes when it appears your story is over. When God is, what God is saying is, you don't get to tell me when the story is over. I'm the author, and so we, we check it out. He says, I'm also the finisher. I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I say when it's over, and this one is not over. I don't need a ghostwriter to tell me the story should end here. I need no ghostwriter when I call in the name of the Holy Ghost to write it farther. I'm going to write it farther and better. I want you to know something. Maybe you feel like after what you've done that God could never use someone like you, that God is angry with you that you blew your chance just like Peter had denied Christ and blown his chance but in these next 40 days God is going to rock your world and replace the lies of the devil with the truth of Jesus and we're going to find ourselves in the 89th chapter and we're going to look deep at the story of Peter and how Jesus forgives him and restores him so do something with me if you will look at these banners on the wall. I want you to look at the first one. You see these, if you, if you look at the first letter of each, it's an acronym for SCARS. And here's what it says. Sin. Experiencing freedom starts by acknowledging that we have all missed the mark. How many of us? All. 
confession. It's what we do after sin that determines whether we experience freedom. God invites us to bring our sin to him. Then absolution. Discover how the consequence of every sin of every person, including yours, has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus. And restoration. Look at it. The forgiveness of Jesus moves us forward by restoring our identity and inviting us to live with purpose. And last, S, sanctification. Now, I can't really see it because of the angle from there. Either that or I need more prayer. But if you guys are close to that, would you turn around and read that out loud? Let's, let's try and read it together. It's going to change for us in these next 40 days. It's going to be extraordinary and significant. My hope is that when we see how Jesus forgives Peter, that we will also experience this freedom that God has for us. You see, the greatest, most impactful mark on humanity in this world are the scars that Jesus had in his resurrected body. This will not be an easy process. It will be painful sometimes. It will be difficult. But if completed to the end, it will leave you with more freedom than you ever thought possible. You see, Jesus had told them at the beginning of his ministry why he came. He would stood up in his own hometown of Nazareth and he had read out of the book of Isaiah. And here's the words that he read. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to pro proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. I believe with all my heart that it's God's plan for us to experience what Jesus paid for. I believe it's God's destiny for us that together we experience forgiveness. Would you stand with me?